for the great pleasure to have an opportunity to hear a special lecture from Dr. Leroy Lowe, long president and co-founder of Getting to Know Cancer in Canada. Uh, actually, uh, Dr. Noboru Yamamoto has arranged and uh, will be chair of this seminar, but uh, he's not, uh, he will be late, so I will take this uh, place this time. And uh, so before starting uh, his uh, Dr. Lowe's talk, I will introduce him briefly. And Dr. Lowe is the president and the co-founder co of Getting to Know Cancer, a Canadian non-profit that is focused on the advancement of cancer research. His PhD is from Lancaster University in the United Kingdom, and he is a key architect of the Halifax Project, a global initiative that involved more than 350 cancer researchers in 31 countries. So he is currently focused on the broad spec clinical trials, a much institution case series that will encompass prophylactic trials. So um, uh, at this time, uh, he actually joined the, uh, another meeting that is the uh, uh, International Conference on Environmental Health and Environmental Related Cancer Prevention 2017. We are uh, held in uh, Tsukuba uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday. And uh, at this opportunity, uh, we asked to him have a, a lecture this time, and he uh, kindly accepted our proposal. And uh, so, and it's, it's, uh, today uh, we are looking forward to learning some new findings in cancer research. The title of his talk is Tackling Heterogeneity in Advanced Cancers with Broad Spectrum Precision Oncology. So, Dr. Lowe, please talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't have the microphone here. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, everyone. Um, special uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Nakagama uh, for uh, hosting uh, me, uh, Dr. Tatsuka, uh, Dr. Sony, and uh, distinguished researchers and uh, invited guests. Uh, well, thank you for coming. Um, today I want to talk a little bit about the challenge of advanced cancers. As you know, uh, we've got new targeted therapies and immunosuppression uh, drugs being introduced. Personalized precision medicine is uh, the direction that things are headed, and new methods of uh, diagnosis and treatment are on the horizon. But many advanced cancers are still incredibly difficult to treat. So I want to talk to you a little bit about of a project that, an initiative that took place between 2012 and 2015 um, that was alluded to at the beginning. It was a project that had 350 scientists from 31 countries, uh, quite a mix of uh, clinical researchers and um, scientists. And the uh, half of that group, roughly 175 researchers, were focused on heterogeneity in advanced cancers. What can we do about it? Um, can we treat it with using a broad spectrum of uh, targets uh, as opposed to single targets that we're working on today or cytotoxics, which uh, haven't uh, really solved the problem for us? And, and what kinds of uh, agents might, might we use to do that? And I want to talk about uh, the concept of uh, broad spectrum pre precision oncology, uh, clinical trials that we have planned, and uh, implementation issues and challenges that we face. Uh, goals for today, I want to share what we've learned uh, with the National Cancer Center. Uh, I want to share what we have planned and find areas of shared interest. I hope we can have some discussion after the fact. And we'd like to inspire a similar research in Japan and open the door for a future collaboration. So in 2011, uh, Getting to Know Cancer was formed. Uh, myself and a co another co-founder uh, started uh, the NGO. Our goal uh, was to focus on two problems. One was in environmental health and one was in uh, therapeutics. We had uh, one task force, uh, 12 teams, that were entirely focused on how to tackle the heterogeneity problem in advanced cancers and reduce the risk of relapse in high-risk patients. The teams were organized around Hannah Hannah Weinberg's Hallmarks of Cancer. Um, 
their goal was to find priority targets, things that you know would be uh, something we would like to reach if we could get to a broad spectrum of targets in a single regimen and safe ways to reach those targets. So most of you uh, may be familiar with uh, Hanahan and Weinberg's Hallmarks of Cancer. Uh, original document came up, paper came out in 2000 and the subsequent in 2011. We, this was really just an organizing framework for us. We wanted to find a way to organize specialists because people's labs were often organized in this way. And we had groups of 10 to 15 researchers in each of these areas, uh, some clinicians, as I said, and some scientists. And their focus was to look at uh, the mechanisms that matter most in those areas, the kinds of agents that could be used to reach them. And if there were other kinds of agents other than what our traditional therapeutics are that we know of, that could be used uh, if we had to reach a broad spectrum of targets simultaneously to deal with the heterogeneity in advanced cancers. Um, the, if I could just back up. Um, all of these areas together are obviously not required to stop cancer, and we've got some very good targeted therapy examples, uh, some successes in the last decade. Uh, where we've been shown that if you can have a single action with a single targeted agent, that you can be successful. Of course, that doesn't always work, but we knew that not uh, actions in all of these areas might not be possible. But because we had researchers in every single area who were doing work on therapeutics, what we wanted to ask them was, if you had to set priorities in your area, what would those targets look like, and how might we reach them safely if we had to reach a broad spectrum of targets simultaneously? Of course, Targeted therapies have already been developed in all these hallmark areas. So you can go find already approved drugs in most of these areas, and there's good examples in each of these areas of things that we can use. The problem with most targeted therapies is illustrated best here, and this is a, an article that was in J Journal of Clinical Oncology. That's a, a BRAF inhibitor. After four months, uh, the patient's almost cleared, and in six months, it's almost a total relapse. And I mean, I think. You can, we all have seen this, you've seen this in the clinic, you know what this looks like in many different kinds of cancers, it's manifested the same kind of effect, and it's a very frustrating issue. The, uh, the, the challenge, of course, and in this is very simplified cartoon, is that our targeted therapies will get to, say, a main population of cells in a cancer, but if the cancer's uh, been around for a certain amount of time, and certainly if it's in late stages, there's enough subpopulations of uh, different types of clones that the targeted, targeted therapy has no effect and those minor subpopulations then reproduce and continue to serve in an immortalized manner and they end up being the relapse that is obviously refractory because the original therapy is not going to work anymore. In the clinic, we use combination and chemotherapy. That's the go-to answer to this problem and there have been some successes. Early leukemias were uh, solved with combination chemotherapies, sometimes cytotoxic, cytotoxic, sometimes targeted therapies, combinations of both. The problem is, is that you can't get very many of these therapies together. You know, two, three, four, five, and that's it. You're at the brink of toxicity and the patient uh, can't tolerate any further. So when you start talking about reaching many dozens of targets simultaneously, something that would be broad enough an array of targets to be able to deal with the kind of complexity that we know exists in, ex in advanced cancers, you can't do it with tools that we currently have in available in the clinic. It just can't uh, get done. Of course, immunotherapy, which has been very exciting and we've seen in the last few years many breakthroughs in immunotherapy. It's exactly the kind of adaptive solution that we had hoped would solve this problem. If we bring immunotherapy to bear, the immune system has its own ability to act in different ways on different types of problems, and that should solve it. Um, the problem is, is that, you know, while we've seen some cancers where this has worked quite well, durable responses are still rare in many advanced cancers. So we've in fact we've got more targets and we've got additional therapeutics but we just don't have combinations even with the existing combinations and immunotherapy that can solve some of our toughest cancers think pancreatic cancer stage 4 or glioblastoma uh, or a range of other cancers that I'm sure you're familiar with the tools that we have so far just won't do it the cross-disciplinary teams that we used uh, focused on our best biology. What do we know about the biology so far? 
what are the key targets and pathways and mechanisms that matter most, and what kind of non-toxic approach could we uh, use. And we didn't set any limits on that. We just said, based on what's in the literature, what could we do? Um, we produced 11 papers and a synthesis paper in a special issue of Seminars in Cancer Biology. The capstone paper, which was a, a product that was worked on by all of the authors, so it's a 175 author paper uh, from authors from 25 countries or something like that, then the paper was iterated several times on some sort of a synthesis. What they came up with was that if we took all the targets that they had in mind, all the different teams that had set their own priorities, and some of those targets were overlapping because we know many molecular mechanisms are relevant to multiple hallmarks, we ended up with 74 high priority targets and 60 treatment approaches, and many of those approaches were nutraceuticals or supplements, uh, plant-based chemicals, and some were off-label or repurposed. I think you used the term reposition pharmaceuticals. And um, then we had a cross um, hallmark assessment uh, led by Dr. Hanoki, who's here today, um, where each of those targets and mechanisms and each of those um, approaches was checked against what was in the literature that could say if you had a particular target in mind and you acted on it and it acted in an anti-carcinogenic way, which is favorable, does it uh, somehow act in a pro-carcinogenic way in any of those other hallmark areas? And so we had 24 people from all the different hallmark areas working in pairs, double checking to make sure that the targets that had been selected weren't great for one area but not great for another area so we didn't have competing effects. And uh, same thing with the agents that were selected. We were looking for examples in the literature where something was really nicely anti-carcinogenic in, say, um, tissue invasion and metastasis, but it turns out it also causes proliferative signaling or something. And, and the results that we came up with was that most of these had complementary effects, most of these agents that were chosen and most of these pathways and a very small minority of them had uh, contrary kinds of pro-carcinogenic effects. We tabularized this and included it as supplemental material. Of course, there was a lot of controversy within our study group over whether or not you could aggregate the information from the literature because there's so many different contexts in which this data was taken. But we felt that it was a good starting point if someone was actually looking to build combinations of agents or combinations of targets that you could reach simultaneously without toxicity and have some indication of whether there were some sort of contrary effects they should be aware of. The question that we were asking, you know, how can we systematically and effectively reach a broad spectrum of high priority targets is the one that would get us past this advanced cancer problem. And, but I want you to think about it in this way. This is the sort of problem that we face. This is a simplified version of the cell, of course. And you can see the P10, PI3K pathway there um, with AKT in the center. And if we showed that in a schematic form, it would look like this. And that's the kind of diagram we often look at when we're talking about a targeted therapy and what it does and how it acts. The problem, of course, is that that's the real picture. Um, we're looking at a very simplified version of what a particular target does when in fact that particular node has activity amongst many pathways. And so when a patient becomes relapsed and someone says, how did that happen when we had a target that worked really well, you have to think about all those escape pathways, that terminology that we use, you know, the, the cells had many escape pathways because you've got so many different options. And in this kind of a network setting, having single targets is just not going to get us there. And that's, that's really the conclusion that we reached. We need to embrace the principles of network pharmacology, and if you know anything about network pharmacology, it's all about understanding a whole network of actions in, that exist. And if you look at, you know, these sort of full-scale diagrams of all the different pathways, and even this is a simplified version because, you know, these are simple representations of networks in each part of the cell, but in reality there's multiple versions of those networks. So there's many versions of the networks, and they exist in, in the whole cell's entirety. That's a very complex network environment to work in to be thinking that a single target is going to get us there. 
And to address this kind of complexity, we think that we have to embrace this sort of mini target, what we call broad spectrum approach. Of course, repurposed pharmaceuticals is not a new thing, and there's been some people looking at this. One of the really intriguing, uh, very simple thing that I've seen recently was a presentation at a cancer conference in the United States recently. There's a group at Harvard that are starting to use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory Ketirilac, which is an IV-administered uh, NSAID, because they found a five-fold improvement in relapses in breast cancers over a great uh, sampling of patients. Uh, they had a really good incidental uh, bit of case uh, information that they were able to gather over a large number of patients, and, and the statistics on it were impressive. And they think that uh, post-surgery, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, may be the key to uh, reducing a lot of relapses. Of course, we know there's a lot of connections between inflammation and the inflammatory environment and the way it acts on all those other areas within that hallmark network. But this seems to be a relatively simple, expensive, and, and low-cost way, uh, inexpensive way to impact uh, relapses significantly. There's another group that's focused on uh, the, uh, and this is just a concept, they have nine or something, uh, it might be seven repurposed pharmaceuticals, all with off-label or reposition targets they think could be used for glioblastoma. Now, this hasn't been implemented. This was just a concept paper. But there is a significant body of underutilized research out there about in vitro and in vivo evidence, and some good examples of phase two trials of things, and resveratrol is probably the most famous example because it was bought, I think, by GlaxoSmithKline for like $750 million from a biotech startup and shelved later. But uh, often because there's no intellectual property, there isn't a lot of incentive to take these products uh, or agents to phase three. But the toxicity levels of these agents is remarkably low. Um, on, on the flip side, or if I can sort of introduce this other variable, is because pa when patients have very few options, many of them resort to these products. And so you get people buying these agents by themselves and not reporting it or confiding in their doctors. And people will take big cocktails of these agents because they could do so with no effect. And the physician will, if they're informed of that, will sort of say, I don't know anything about that, and I don't want to hear about it because you're potentially just complicating matters. And I, and I, believe, I also agree that that's true. We don't want patients who have no understanding of the molecular biology of cancer making decisions about what kinds of things they might be taking. Um, but the reality is, is the reason that they can do this is because there is very little toxicity and you can take a lot of these agents. And yet we have good evidence in the literature about the kinds of mechanisms these agents can reach. Um, in the United States, though, despite all of this interest in these products, the, they've never approved a dietary supplement or food to prevent cancer or the, halt the growth of cancer or cancer recurrence. So these are products that are widely available to the public. They're out there. People are taking them but they're of no interest to the oncology community. They don't uh, align with the existing standard of care. And we have the same insurance issues in the United States, or in the United States they have the same insurance issues I know you have around what is allowed to be used and what is not. Um, it, we have a field uh, globally called integrative oncology, but those practitioners largely use these kinds of agents for side effects, uh, things like nausea, sleep, anxiety. Um, but a recent survey in a state in the United States of practitioners using those agents calculated there was uh, 92, or sorry, 72 topical, nutritional, botanical, fungal, and bacterial-based medicines being used by these practitioners. So a wide range of these things. And yet those individuals have no understanding of the molecular biology of cancer. Those are agents that are being chosen for other reasons and introduced alongside of existing um, oncology and for just unrelated reasons. And so th these things are being introduced by the patients and by other, on uh, other oncologists, but not for the purposes that we're talking about. Um, there are a small number of clinicians, very small number, who are actually learned molecular biology of cancer, reading the literature intently, and pulling these agents systematically based on what they know matters in terms of the biology of cancer, and who are reporting, in some cases, good results. But they tend not to get their hand up too high because they're completely 
uh, not aligned with mainstream oncology. Uh, most of them are busy in the clinic and really are not people that write for journals, so they're not reporting it anywhere, and the statistics on this are poor. And some of them have a very good understanding of molecular biology of cancer and some not. So it's really quite a mix, and it's not regulated, so it's not happening in any way that would satisfy anybody who really wanted to take it on and apply serious science and rigor to it. So it's a bit of a problem. The first principles, as far as we're concerned, this large task force, is that the biology shows us we need to reach many, many targets to treat self-mutating immortalized cells in cancers that are advanced and heterogeneity, have a lot of heterogeneity. We've got next, I just came from a biomarkers conference uh, last month, and there were people there talking about next generation sequencing, whole, geno whole, whole genome sequencing, uh, proteomics, metabolomics, uh, all the information that's coming down the pipe. Like, there's a ton of new information that can help us characterize cancers. But everybody, nobody has an answer to what are we going to do with that information. Even with the best information possible, if we have the best targets possible, we still can't deal with the kind of complexity that I've been talking about. So this idea of having better information is good, but if we have 30 or 40 places that we want to attack, how do we do that safely? Because right now there's no way to do that. Really, after the whole project was finished, we had really only accomplished uh, a concept. We had laid out the argument for why a broad spectrum of targets is needed. Uh, of course, there's anecdotal clinical examples, but really to do this well, we understood that we need to make the argument, and so that was the point of our work, to identify agents that could be used, to lay out the concept, and create a, a starting point for people that were interested. Since the project finished, I pulled together an advisory board from some researchers from Stanford, Yale, Harvard, uh, Columbia, uh, some uh, researcher from Canada, one from Australia. Most of these people were either involved in the project or they have, um, they're philosophically aligned with what we're trying to accomplish because they've been dealing with advanced cancers. Some of them are researchers, some of them are clinicians. Our goal is to pull oncologists into the, pro oncologists into the project because we want to do a very small series of exploratory clinical trials to demonstrate that this can work. And when I say small clinical trials, I just want to be careful. I put clinical trials in quotes. I mean trials in the clinic, but not hundreds or thousands of patients. You know, we want to start with 10 patients of one cancer type. And we want to get some uh, show that somebody who's got a 12-month prognosis with a stage 4 and has very few options uh, can be given a better quality of life and extended survival time and we can repeat that in more than one instance. So that's the direction that this group is headed and we're really working on it now. Today all I'm going to do is share with you w why we think it can be done and how it can be implemented and so um, that's kind of what I want to show you. Currently we've looked at advanced stage ovarian cancer which has really no therapeutic options once you get late stages advanced stage pancreatic cancer, glioblastoma, and I have a particular interest in M, uh, AML uh, from MDS patients who have a very high occurrence, mainly because we were looking for a way to apply this prophylactically, and we know that these patients already have dysfunctional uh, bone marrow, and we wanted to show that the transition to AML could be prevented. Um, so this will be probably extend even beyond cancer into some of those other symptoms that are experienced. Uh, in MDS. Our approach is to develop a methodology for a personalized low toxicity combination protocol that will do what I've just described, the small number of case studies. We're going to recruit recru uh, clinicians and researchers to collaborate. We've got a uh, cancer type selected. We're going to provide safety guidelines for incrementally staged metronomic dosing of combinations of agents, and I'm going to talk about that in a, in a little bit. Uh, we want to provide intellectual support um, and input for FDA discussions. We've already initiated some preliminary discussions with FDA. They understand that current therapeutics aren't going to get us there. And this idea that the phase three clinical trial gold standard as a bar is the starting point for having an agent that could be considered in a combination is way too high. Uh, the, you know, the cost that goes with doing that is enormous, 
the number of agents we've ended up with is quite small. The pipeline results are very disappointing. And frankly, we don't think that many of the targets that the teams focused on are probably going to yield a chemical or an agent that will ever stop cancer. Think VEGF and angiogenesis and how disappointing that's been. It's a part of the puzzle, but on its own, it's not going to stop cancers. And we're thinking many of the mechanisms that we're trying to reach on their own, if you had a targeted agent that just focused on that, you may never get through phase three clinical trials. What we want is a series of actions on agents that will conspire to produce synergies by acting in all the areas that matter simultaneously, and that combination regimen would be able to get us to where we need to be in terms of stopping cancers. But the individual target may not be satisfactory. And so that bar is, needs to be changed. We're not there yet regula regulation-wise, but w that's the direction we're moving, and we want to give them an early heads up on what we have in mind so that when we go to apply for research uh, latitude that the re institutional re review boards will understand we've already had those discussions and will give us the latitude we need to do the experiments that we need to do. What will it take to make this happen? The, the goal here is what can we do now with what we know already? Think about the enormous amount of research that's been done and how well characterized the disease is and how slow our progress has been. You know, the first targeted agent I would say is probably uh, tamoxifen is, you know, how long ago is that? When, and we do have new agents coming out, but it's slow and there's still a lot of cancers where there's just no solution. And we wanted to find some way that we could do something that could start in a very sort of quick fashion and make some headway. So here's how we think it can be done. And this is really the approach we have in mind. First, you need prioritized targets. Well, for a lot of these advanced cancers, cancers, there's canonical targets already. The disease has been characterized. Often we have subtypes that have been described. And we know what the main targets are going to be or look like. In addition to that, you've got patient genomics, proteomics, and other biomarkers, and that's rapidly improving. And most people, uh, the, so we have the priorities of existing standard of care, they're not going to change. Those, you know, the estrogen receptor, receptor in breast cancer, that's not going to change. When we're talking about a large number of other targets, we're saying there's going to be other things that matter. We're still saying surgery, radiation, cytotoxics, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, none of that changes. But in addition, we think there's a long roster of other targets that could really make a difference. We need to be able to reach those targets in a very uh, focused way, not to interfere with the oncology uh, existing standard of care, but improve outcomes. And that's the, that's the goal. The, of course, some of those agents were identified in the project that we worked on, so there's sort of a, a starting point. Um, we have people now working on doing iterative Boolean searches where we're using the cancer type, the cell type, uh, or the diagnosis um, in PubMed and doing priority molecular targets, whatever they are, the pathway or the network. And we're looking for natural products, polyphenols, herbal products, herbs, plants, extracts, repurposed or off-label kinds of indications, and we're finding studies that are relevant. And we're um, using similar articles and cited by articles to try and continue to build a body of evidence in support of the kinds of um, uh, pathways or agents that we have in mind. Of course, this is not a trivial exercise. You can't just go gather a bunch of evidence and you know what the evidence looks like. It's, it's not phase three clinical trials. Sometimes it's only in vitro. Sometimes it's in vivo rodent. Uh, sometimes there's multiple studies in multiple cell types, but it never got past the mouse. Um, you've got maybe convincing molecular uh, cellular receptor action, for example, a ligand or, uh, that you can identify, but you don't have potentially bioavailability, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics. You don't have all those things that you would have with existing drugs. But you do sometimes have information on dosing, and there are ways to get from animal dosing to humans safely. And a lot of times these things, because they're agents that are available now to patients that you can, or to the general population, there's dosing information that's available from the um, manufacturers. And there's sometimes information available on toxicity. And, of course, you can look for studies that might show any kind of contraindications or pro-carcinogenic mechanistic effects. 
The goal is to develop a roster of dozens of agents. We know there's more than 150 natural products in North America that are readily available, but availability matters. We want to settle on a list of potential items, that agents that we could use for the targeted purposes that is widely available. When we're done, we're hoping that this is something that could be used uh, almost anywhere. So the general availability of agents is important, not some exotic uh, chemical that came out of a plant in the Amazon rainforest that has never been uh, brought to market. But we're looking for things that can be uh, reached easily. And we are looking for manufacturers of those agents that have well-developed quality systems. So GMP facilities, ISO, et cetera, not some small operation that's producing things that might have questionable quality. Here's an example of uh, some of the results that would come up if you did the kind of searching that I'm talking about for a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And this is not a definitive list, but this is just a group of the kinds of things that we're talking about. So I can give you kind of a realistic picture of what, what that would look like. And if I give you just one of those agents, luteolin, and pancreatic adenocarcinoma, you'll see that this is a series of studies that come up. So some of these, rep the first one is about decreasing invasiveness and deactivating STAT3 signaling. Um, there's uh, one about um, growth inhibition, and there's one about synergies being produced, and one for focal adhesion kinase. And so we get a range of potential targets. And now you might look at that and say, well, what does this chemical really do? Because there's a bunch of targets there. Well, um, I'm going to talk about that diversity or range of things that we find in some of these chemicals in a minute, but I'll just I'll let you think about that. Here's a sample of repurpose pharmaceuticals that you get when you look for pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And when I say when you look for that particular pancreatic adenocarcinoma, this might have been a cell line that was being used that was aligned. So it, it, and there might be other studies, but we start with studies that are just focused on a particular cell type. And here's a handful of chemicals, uh, repurposed or repositioned pharmaceuticals that come up. Here's just an example of the list of some of the studies that come up for metformin and pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And it's a long list of actions and a long list of effects. Not what you would expect. You know, when you think about targeted therapy, you're thinking a chemical that has a single action on a single receptor acting in a single way is very predictable. In this case, we've got really good documentation of lots of different molecular effects, some of which are repeated in multiple studies, but sometimes they'll say, you know, we've seen these actions, but we're also seeing this and this and this. And it's that molecular action and promiscuity that actually plays in our favor when it comes to cancer. Because of the kind of network I described to you, if you've got an agent that's reaching multiple targets and doing so in a favorable way that's been documented, that's buying you extra targets within a system, a whole syst network system, that can help you. The protocol development is to prioritize the agents based on the target priorities. That can be developed as I, as I described. Embrace supporting evidence of similar mechanistic actions across cell types. So if you find that a particular agent for pancreatic adenocarcinoma has a particular receptor action, and you also see reports that other people have showed that same effect on that same receptor type in the same machinery in nine other cell lines or in different species of rodents, then that gives you some confidence that there's repeatability. And the broader the body of evidence, the more convincing it is across multiple scenarios in different contexts to show the same mechanistic action gives us confidence that we've got the right action in mind. And so some of what we do to build confidence around those agents is to look at how widely has this been researched? How many cell lines has it been looked at? Have we seen consistency of its molecular effects? Not just the promiscuity, but the same target that we're looking for and the promiscuity that we're, we're talking about. And are there any pro-carcinogenic effects as well? So it's not just assuming that everything is good, but people are studying these things because they look like they have promise. So if anything shows up that looks like it might not uh, that work against you, that's often reported as well. So that's the kind of thing that we're looking for. Just to give you an example, this is a network of targets, and you can see the purple arrows are down regulation and the green arrows are up, and that's curcumin. Now, this study's 
almost 10 years old. It's like maybe seven years old. But curcumin has been studied a lot, and we could go to every single one of those targets now, and we know whether or not those things need to be upregulated or downregulated because our understanding of the biology has improved so much. We can look at all the known actions, and we can ask ourselves, are those the right kinds of actions that we're looking for or the wrong type, which is a good, can give us a flag if we don't want something to happen. Uh, it turns out curcumin has a remarkable series of actions across a broad array of targets that are very favorable towards anti-carcinogenic action. So it's really a, an important constituent out of the kinds of things that we would be looking for and the kinds of mixtures that we're, look, that we're talking about. We also can think about adjuvant protocols. In addition to surgery, NSAIDs, for example, was a simple one. But in addition to chemotherapy, uh, that, and when I, in chemotherapy, I'm talking about cytotoxics. There are actually good, there's good literature on how some of these agents are really good for chemosensitization and uh, working on reducing chemo resistance. Same thing with radiation therapy. There's really good literature on how some of these agents are good at sensitizing things for radiation therapy and for uh, reducing radiation resistance. I'll give you, just give you a quick example. These are uh, four studies that were for luteolin, the substance I showed you previously, that talk about this specific chemical and how it produces um, a, an effect that would be favorable for cytotoxics. And uh, there's a couple of different cell lines here. Now, uh, this, in this case, we're talking about fulfirinox, the uh, regimen that would be applicable for the type of cancer that I was talking about. And there's examples here of how it produces synergies that are relevant for a number of constituents within that particular chemotherapeutic regimen. Here's another series of papers on resveratrol, same kind of thing. Individual studies that showed that when you add this particular agent into the mix, that it's favorable for chemotherapy and helps with the delivery of chemotherapy itself. You have the same thing for radiation sensitivity. Uh, this is uh, for a, a, a substance called berberin. And the same thing, again, for honokiol and resveratrol for radiation sensitivity. I'll leave these slides with you. I've left all the PMIDs in there. If you're interested in just seeing this, you know, the slides will be available. But I want to give you a sense that with existing standard of care, there's a place for these agents to improve outcomes. Often the studies that get done are single studies. They have no um, uh, champion. The drug companies aren't interested in these agents. There's no money in, in, in these agents. And I'm not trying to say drug companies are bad. I'm just saying there's no financial momentum to make this happen. And so that despite the fact that somebody's done some good work in the lab to show how this could work, it never makes it into trials. Or if it does, it's early stage, and that's the end of it. You never see it again. But what we're saying is within the context of what we have planned, if you looked at existing standard of care, there are a number of reasons why introducing a broad series of these agents could be helpful, not just to reach additional targets, but also to improve outcomes in the existing standard of care that we have to offer. From patient safety was put up as the top, top priority in the Halifax project. We started with patient safety, and we said, whatever ideas you come up with, we're not going to put patients through the kind of pain that came with early chemotherapy uh, ideas. You know, when we introduced cytotoxics and the whole idea of maximum tolerated dose, we said, you know, this is going to be horrible for the patient. They're going to be in a very, very bad place. We might even take them to the brink of death, but they're going to be better for it. And it turned out that that was, you know, that was based on good science, and we did see some results. And that's why chemotherapy persists to this day. We're not talking about anything that looks like that. What we're talking about is introducing as many of these agents as we can to reach a large number of targets and taking the doses up in a very careful way and then stepping back if there's any kind of side effects whatsoever, minor side effects, not, tox not like at the brink of toxicity. If somebody's got mild discomfort as a result of something that was introduced, we'll pull it out and trade it for something else. We don't, we don't want to be slave to a single regimen for any one patient. And we don't want to be slave to a single dose level for any one patient. We want to start low and systematically introduce this regimen in a stepwise fashion, day over day over day, and build up the patient's comfort with it, 
And if there's the least bit of problem, whatever were the last couple of items that went in, come out of the mix and something goes in to replace it that the patient tolerates well and continue on. It's a very uh, cautious kind of approach where we expect you can do this without really interfering with the patient's quality of life. In fact, it should have uh, an improvement on their quality of life. And from what we have anecdotally from some clinics we know that have tried this already, that's exactly what happens. They actually have better quality of life during their existing standard of care time, and they get better survival times. But like I said, the examples are few, um, and I, you can't rely on them because the numbers are so, so low at this point. Um, all right. This is intended to be oral. It's intended to allow the patients to go home. This could occur over a year or two. So this is a regimen that patients have to document their own compliance, and we recommend having a, a champion, somebody who's a family member or somebody who's close, who can help them with documentation and make sure that they're building and following the protocol and that they've got close physician support while this is happening. A truly personalized protocol, now think about this, we're talking about personalized medicine, should start with a broad spectrum of targets because of what we talked about, this network problem and the heterogeneity issue. We, need, we have to have agents that can reach those targets without toxicity, and we should embrace molecular promiscuity. My uh, institution is right next door to an agricultural facility. And a researcher who does cancer products that come from food said, well, I went to the FDA recently meeting and I showed him this agent. And we've had remarkable results with this agent. But when I explained to the people at the FDA that it reached nine different targets, they dismissed it immediately. Like, forget it. We're not even interested. We think that we need to embrace that kind of promiscuity as long as those other actions are well characterized and as long as what we know about those other actions is positive as it relates to the disease. We need to standardize the approach. The method has to be the same, but it's going to be personalized and tailored to every single patient. Dose levels are going to vary. The agents are going to vary. And that's a very different concept than anything we've seen before. But think about the molecular makeup of what we see when we see genetics in advanced cancers. Every patient is different. You know, we call it stage four pancreatic cancer. But if I put 40 of them in a row and I said, show me the data from the molecular makeup of every single cancer, it would all be different. And our toolkit right now is existing phase three clinical trial approved agents. And that toolkit is too small to deal with the kind of complexity we're seeing. And that's why the outcomes are so poor. We want to leverage the massive accumulated base of research on all of these agents. There have been bench researchers spent years, decades, literally, producing this pile of research on these agents, and none of them are being used. It's, 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 a, it's a shame when you think about it. And now that we understand the problem, we think that we've got a way to take advantage of it, and maybe all that work is going to pay off in a way that will be meaningful in the clinic. This is something that can be advanced now. You could build a program to do this starting tomorrow. Now, we don't, we don't plan to go very far. If we don't get success in the first small numbers of patients that we try, we may, we may go back and try to analyze what happened. But the best science that we have, our best understanding of biology, tells us that everything about this, this makes sense. It's a way to get to a broad array of targets without harming the patient in a way that would be safe. With an aging population, you know patients that are older tolerate the kinds of therapies that we have now quite poorly. Having some kind of regimen that could be done that doesn't introduce any additional uh, duress is important, and we think it, it, it can work. Our goal is to both improve quality of life and survival time. So this is not intended to be something that will be difficult for patients to manage something that we want to put alongside existing as standard of care and something that we, they will tolerate. I go to, I draw, I just point your attention to the chapter 37 of the most recent version of the Declaration of Helsinki. Any of you who are doing research know this document well, I'm sure. But it says, where proven interventions don't exist or known interventions are ineffective, with informed, and consent, with informed consent, you can use an unproven intervention if in the physician's judgment it offers hope of saving life. The people in the clinic are relying on this. 
But I want to go to the last part, and the last part says that this intervention should subsequently be made the object of research and designed and evaluated for safety and efficacy. And we've got enough people tinkering with these agents. We've got patients tinkering with these agents on their own, creating mixtures at home. We've got integrative oncologists that are introducing these agents for unrelated purposes. When the main cause of the disease, this immortalized proliferating cell bath mass that has all these clonal subpopulations is the central problem. And if you don't solve that, you don't solve the problem. And so we think that it's time to bring some scientific rigor to the use of these agents. They're being introduced anyway. Bring them in in a safe manner that doesn't disrupt existing standard of care, but do it in a way that can actually give us some opportunity to try to address that network issue that I was explaining to you. I looked at the National Cancer Center Research Institute website uh, weeks ago when I was uh, asked to come, and I read it, and it says, you know, new treatment methods using genome, epigenome, proteome, and metabolome, and, a and with a wide variety of genomic differences between tumors and potential adverse reactions, we've got to use genomic information to optimize methods of treating cancer. And I would argue that what we've described is exactly what this institution was built to do. Coming downstairs from, in the elevator from the waiting room where I was upstairs, um, my uh, gracious host pointed out all the different areas within the groups that were in the building. And I was reading them, and I was going down the list, and I was thinking, you have in this facility every bit of expertise you need to make this work and do it at a very high level. We don't have this underway in North America yet, but I have some of the best researchers and oncologists on board to make this happen, and our intention is to push it forward. And I'm hoping that I can inspire you with what I've showed you today to think about how you might be able to consider this or some aspect of this in what you do. We'd be quite open to any kind of collaboration or mutual interest that you might have. With that, I'd like to just give some quick acknowledgments. These are the team leaders of each of those teams that I described to you that were involved in the Halifax project. And each of those team leaders actually was working with, uh, you know, 15 researchers or so. And I just want to give some thanks to them for their efforts and to the team members that worked on their teams. Special mention to a gentleman named Will Lavalley, who's an outstanding uh, clinician. He's one of the, he's, he's perhaps the person who's on the cutting edge of this in the United States. He runs a private clinic. He uh, understands the molecular biology of cancer, and he's done exactly what we've described. And yet, he knows that this needs better science. He, it, he needs more minds focused on it. He needs the kind of teamwork that it will take to really make this come to fruition and turn it into something that can help many clinicians uh, across several, uh, many countries. I also want to point out the Japanese contributors to the Halifax project, and they're listed there as well, because we had a really good contingent from Japan working on many of the teams that we had involved. And a special thanks to my advisory board, a um, very distinguished group, and I'm really looking forward to working with them going forward, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, 
Well, I think what's happening is we're getting, uh, from the work that's being done and the kind of omics data that's being generated, we're getting lots of clinical ideas as to where we might take it. So when we, as we start to get this information, we've got researchers who are saying, with this information, we should be do taking this kind of action. And what we're saying is, you can almost go anywhere in the entire constellation of targets that you might have, be they pathways, mechanisms, receptors, etc. If you have an understanding from that omics data where you think you need to go, there is good literature on the kinds of agents that you might use to do that safely. And so if your existing standard of care is that we've got our best combination chemotherapy currently in play, um, on a patient who has this kind of cancer and, you know, we don't think it's going to be adequate, the question would be what do you have in that uh, genetic proteomics, metabolomics, what other information is there and what kinds of other targets might you choose? If you told me what the targets were, you can go to the literature and figure out what kinds of agents you might use. That's how we're saying the combinations will be constructed. You're not going to tinker with existing targets priorities because those are known in most cases. And so those priorities are there and you let them, uh, you treat them as you normally would. But then you look at what other targets might we add into the mix. So maybe if you know that there are multiple subpopulations of cell, let's say bio, bio, uh, biopsy revealed that yes, some of the cells are uh, the standard targets we were expecting. But we've got other cells that we've analyzed that have very different targets, uh, unusual ones, ones that for which there's no therapy for, or one for which the only therapy is for a different type of cancer, and we don't know if we want to introduce that into the mix because the toxicity will be too high. It's all those other kinds of targets that you might identify. We want to say, don't get rid of those. Let's take each one of those targets, and let's systematically look for some agent we could introduce to get there, and that's how we would introduce this alongside of what's being done already. I see. But, uh, um, for example, I suppose that natural product has many <coughs> targets yes. to act on. In some cases, absolutely. And, and what we're saying is we're not afraid of those other targets. In fact, we think that we want to focus on the targets we know are priorities from the patient's information. Those, those emerging targets that we see from biopsy or from any other means that we have, biomarker discovery, uh, liquid biopsy, whatever, those other targets that we see, we, we want to respect those as being important. When we pick an agent and we say, this looks like an agent that's been worked on in that cell type, and it appears over multiple cell lines to have an action that should be helpful for that target. Oh, but there's nine other things that it does. The question we're asking is, well, those nine other things, are they all positive? Are they all anti-carcinogenic in some way? Because we'll take those extra actions. We want them. When you think about that constellation of possible actions, we can look at every single other reported action those cells have shown and we can ask ourselves, are those pro-carcinogenic or anti-carcinogenic? And if they're anti-carcinogenic, we'll take them. We want extra actions. That's what I'm saying. The promiscuity, this, this ability of some of these chemicals not just to reach the wanted target, but to reach seven others, that's good. Because we've got, we've got from any given biopsy or any given, uh, whether that's a physical sample or a liquid biopsy or, or whatever, we, we still don't know in an advanced cancer whether we have all the information. We, we only have samples of information. If you think about a cell mass as representing multiple subpopulations, you get one sample here and one here. Do you have them all? We don't know. So we're saying from the information you have, you set your priorities. From the agents that you choose, you're going to get additional actions. And you look at all those additional actions to make sure they're anti-carcinogenic in some way. The fact that those other actions are acting in positive anti-carcinogenic ways on other parts of the network, that's a good thing. We'll, we'll take those actions because there's no toxicity for doing it and the constellation of actions on the network collectively will have a bigger impact than a single action on one part of the network which leaves many other escape pathways. Any 
question or comment? Maybe uh, I'm not uh, familiar with uh, uh, clinical trials, but so uh, my question is a little stupid, but uh, I just want to know that uh, a natural product is actually occurring in a natural, I mean that the food or the beverages. So how do you control the dose for the uh, clinical? So people that have been doing this in the clinic sort of rely on their own clinical experience. Often if you go and buy some product uh, that's available, curcumin, resveratrol, whatever, uh, there will be some recommended dose. Now that has no bearing on cancer. We don't know whether or not that would be adequate to get into the bloodstream. We don't know if there's bioavailability that makes it efficacious. Uh, we don't even know if it gets into the bloodstream if it's going to reach the tumor. We think that but we, what we do know is that some of these agents are making it into the bloodstream and some of these agents are having an effect. So we're not relying on a small number of them. We think we need to reach 30 or 40 agents and we will escalate the dosing based on patient tolerance. And so we will continue to stack dosing and increase dosages above what is recommended by the, doc, uh, by the manufacturer, for example but we will only take it to a level that causes any kind of discomfort. And the moment there's any discomfort, we back off. And we continue at a lower level, and then we continue to add. And we make replacements as ne necessary. So the dosing is cautious. It's uh, based on this idea that we know if we can get more agent, then that will help with the bio bioavailability issue. And, and yet, we still will never know, probably, that all of those agents made it into the mix. You know, some of them may never make it to the location they're supposed to get to. But by creating a diversity of agents and all of those agents having different tissue affinities, all of them having demonstrated that if they do reach it, they could have an effect, we think those additional actions on the, on the uh, tumor will be uh, beneficial. We do, and one of the trials we have planned is uh, prophylactic. Our intention is to explore how these might work. A lot of these agents have actually been recommended for cancer prevention because their actions appear to have a favorable impact. And um, we think that the same kind of approach could be taken. Yet, I don't think it would be something we would be thinking about recommending to the general population, or at least we're not, that's not where we're thinking at the moment. But we're saying if someone who has high risk, let's say somebody who is genetically predisposed to a particular cancer type because of a particular mutation, we might recognize that they're high risk and offer some sort of very safe regimen that covered a broad spectrum of targets with no toxicity over an extended period of time and hope to reduce their risks in doing so. We're not sure if somebody is predisposed and they have a lifetime risk of 50%, um, how you would actually ever prove that you had succeeded because uh, unless you did a very large cohort over a very long period of time. And maybe some sort of longitudinal study could be constructed. Uh, I guess for that reason, it hasn't been our priority, but I could definitely foresee that if this was successful and it works uh, the way we anticipate that it will, that that sort of an approach, especially in the very highest risk cases, and in particular for relapse, so somebody that has already had treatment and who is in remission, but for which the statistics are not very good, we feel that a prophylactic application in that sense makes sense, and getting them beyond that sort of five-year window, which is so crucial, um, is uh, something that we could envision using it in, for that purpose. Thank you very much. So uh, we'd like to close the seminar. And after this seminar, the discussion. Uh, so anyway, so uh, thank you very much for that. Okay, so, thank you.